Magdalena Grand. And you can start your summer right at the Magdalena Grand Beach and uh, Golf Resort. Uh, book by July 15th and receive 50% off the third night accommodation in a deluxe oceanfront room, inclusive of buffet breakfast for two persons. For reservations more information, you can call 660 uh, 8500 that's 660 8500 if, if you're outside it's 868-660-8500 or log on to www.magdalenagrand.com the magdalena grand beach and golf resort the majesty of tobago awaits you speaking of the majesty of tobago or his majesty of tobago <laughs> let's introduce our next guest <laughs> madam george good morning pleasure thank you for joining pleasure. us this it's morning Paul, because we can come from tobago and let's talk to the mayor <laughs> well paul i am so happy that you all have taken the initiative to actually come to tobago to do a show because it shows tremendous respect and courtesy for tobagonians and i think i speak on behalf of all tobagonians to welcome your team here well that was the rationale and we also be, we're going to be going to other areas in trinidad but we decided why not come to tobago of course <laughs> of course of course know, a great place so we to go, start. we're going to Shigonas, we're going to san fernando right. we're also going to Aruma in the coming weeks okay, as we excellent. lead up to september 7th excellent. you you were born uh, and bred in Tobago. You've been a strong advocate of the issues facing Tobago. We have seen a different kind of political dynamic develop in the last couple of weeks. Uh, the Tobago Falls, we had Kristen Moore on earlier. We had uh, uh, Mrs. Allen Toppin, Top General Allen Toppin, uh, Tobago East, just immediate past MP and Minister of the Ministry of Social Development. We have independent Watson Duke, who we'll have on later on in the weekend. Okay. We have Orville London, the Chief Secretary of the Assembly, on Friday morning. We've had Ho Choi Charles, we've had uh, Arthur N.R. Robinson, we have Dr. Keith Rowley as leader of the PNM now. Mm -hmm. Tobago is front and center in the politics of Trinidad and Tobago. But Tobagonians have not benefited as much in terms of resources and development when you compare both islands. Why is that? Well, I think primarily it is because the leaders we've had in Tobago have not been able to translate whatever political gains they have made into actual infrastructural development for Tobago. Now, part of this would have been because in some ways you are hamstrung because you will have to get your allocations from central government. But the point is, when you do get them, you ask yourself, what has been done with it? You look at the history of the THA for the last, say, 14 years or so, Paul, and you consider how many billions, it's over $20 billion that would have passed through the THA in just allocations that the government has given them. What have they to show for it? You look around Tobago, take your cameras around Tobago, drive we around, have, um, and you will ask yourself, where is the money? Where has it gone? And it's no excuse for the leaders of the THA now to say, well, you know, there's squander mania going on in Trinidad also. That's not the answer. We in Tobago are calling upon them to say, can you account for what you have done with the money? And they are not able to. But if we look at the last 20 years, of, as you reference, there... Mr. London and, and this incarnation of the Assembly has not always been in the leadership. So is, is it a systemic issue? Is it about the evolution of the Tobago House of Assembly? Are there islands in the Caribbean that have less resources than Tobago that have done more? A lot more. And this is what I'm saying. So the point is they are not the only ones to blame. Certainly for the last 14 years, they have been the ones in charge. And we've had the greatest number of allocations in terms of the quantity of the budgets so when you look at it previously it was not in these these several billions of dollars so therefore they've actually had the greatest allocation of resources and the least to show for it unfortunately so therefore they cannot escape responsibility and accountability and it's not a question of castigating persons or passing blame it's a question of saying hey listen let's be honest let's be practical let's look at the figures let's look at the results it's a simple thing you have what is your input what is your output as a result of it and they don't match up at all there, there's a, a, a narrative now about uh, employment in Tobago with a suggestion that there is a Kristen Moore mentioned reference reference it earlier on where the assembly contributes, it will supplies too much of the employment uh, and not necessarily productive employment of that, uh, ERP type programs. And not with the exception of hotels like the Marketing like Grand and others, mm -hmm. which are really tourism based industries. There has not been an evolution of the employment uh, scenario in Tobago. Uh, how would you classify that? Well, the thing is, I have said it quite candidly, and of course, I've been chastised for saying so, but I, I am firmly of the view 
that it has been a deliberate and concerted plan and program by the leaders of the THA in this present incarnation, whereby they want to make sure the population of Tobago is almost totally dependent on the THA for employment. And that way, they want to translate that into a dependency for votes. What, what, so what the would, they gain, what would purpose, they gain from that? Votes? That's the whole purpose. Why, why would I vote for you if you have me as a dependent and not, and not being able to reach my fullest potential and evolve? Because the point is, the way it has occurred in Tobago, the level of victimization that has occurred is that if you don't show that support, you get nothing at all. You are, you know, they, they, they cancel people's contracts at will, you know, because of allegations or, you know, um, suspicions of, you know, your political allegiance. That happens on a daily basis in Tobago. And I'm just speaking just from a legal perspective from persons who have come to us with cases. So when you speak to the public, they will tell you even more instances of that type of thing. So the whole idea has been that they've tried to control the population by that employment, so whether it's through URP, CPEP, you know, whatever, temporary make work initiatives, you know, you have lots of people who may say, well, look, I'm renting cars to the assembly, so therefore the assembly has you on a string, or you're renting equipment, heavy equipment to the you're assembly. You're suggesting tow the line or suffer. Exactly. And it has worked brilliantly for them thus far, in that they've had the majority of the population totally dependent on the THE for their main employment. And I have suggested, and again, um, it's not been received very well by the leaders of the THA, but I try to speak frankly and candidly, and I try to analyze things dispassionately for Tobagonians. And what I have seen is that the tourism industry has been systematically undermined and dismantled by this regime because they did not wish for Tobagonians to have that independence. Paul, think of it. If the average Tobagonian is able to run a little guest house, to have little car rentals, and you have lots of tourists flowing in and out, then he is independently um, financially stable and secure. Therefore, he may not need the assembly, so therefore, he doesn't have to tow that line. And I think because of that, they felt threatened, they felt afraid, so therefore they tried to undermine and whittle away at the tourism industry so that you all now must come back to me as the great employer. It's, it's, it's absurd when you think of it that your governing body is your largest employer. It makes no sense. Given what we've heard in, in the public domain in the last couple of weeks regarding accountability, regarding uh, millions of dollars that accounted for in, in the assembly, if that sort of scenario were to occur in, at any enterprise or regional corporation through that, there'd be a huge uproar. Why is there not a louder chorus coming from Tobagonians about that lack of accountability, not only financially, but in the healthcare sector, which has affected Tobagonians directly in terms of life and living in, in some instances? Why is there that, that, that acceptance of well, that? Well, I, I think it's not so much acceptance, I think it's fair in that persons are afraid to speak out. Because I tell you, Paul, the, the level of victimization, it is really a real and direct threat to persons' employment and your livelihood. So therefore, persons will see you quietly and whisper and will say, yes, you know, I am concerned. But to come out on a public scenario, they are afraid we, We'll to have Mr. So. London on Friday morning, but do, you're an attorney. Can you provide proof of this victimization? Because it's all well and good to come on national television and say, well, the assembly is victimizing people uh, seemingly en masse to, to control them in terms of votes or, or resources. But what, what evidence do we have to support well, this? Well, as I said, I am speaking from the perspective of persons who would have come to me in my practice. Obviously, I can't mm -hmm. divulge any de details in terms of names or anything, So, but I have seen. So this is, that's why I tell you, I'm not relying on you know, gossip or anything of the sort. From the matters that have actually come to us in our law firm, I can tell you for sure it is occurring. What, I have seen the what if, if that is true, in addition to uh, legal uh, recourse, what other recourse can there be given the present arrangement constitutionally between Trinidad and Tobago. And we, we really want to get to, to of course, the, the, the Tobago House of Assembly Act here and how it should evolve, because it certainly, from what most people are saying, has not been serving Tobago in terms of its possible evolution. Well, the, the thing is, in terms of the Act, I think that Mr. London would be the best person to give some explanation as to what really happened back in that 1996 
redraft of the Tobago House of Assembly Act because the PNM members of parliament were the ones who made the most vociferous arguments to ensure that notwithstanding the additional freedoms and liberties and powers that the assembly was given, you then handcuffed the assembly back to the policy making of cabinet by saying that little piece that section 25 of the 1996 THA Act is subject to section 75 of the constitution which gives cabinet the overall direction and control. So it was really a massive uh, you know, misinterpretation or misapprehension by most people when they thought the House of Assembly is getting expanded powers. So I give you, in other words, I give you a longer leash, Paul, but you're still tied to a stake. So in other words, you can roam in a larger area, but you're still tied to me. You're still on a leash. Is the, is the act that open to interpretation in terms of its actual oper operationalization? Given the kinds of back and forth we've heard between the central government and the assembly, when the same political entity is not present as the majority in both entities? Well, the act is open to interpretation as are all laws. However, the wording of it, and this is why we went back to Hansard, and it is clear when you're trying to do statutory interpretation, one of the resources you can rely on is you go back to the parliamentary debates and you rely on what was said in Hansard. And when you look at it, it is very clear. There's absolutely no doubt about it. And in fact, Mr. Robinson said in his contribution, he said, even though this is not what we want, we are making the concession to the members on the other side because they have insisted that we now bring it back and put it back under Section 75 of the Constitution. So those words are very clear and distinct. So it's difficult to put a different spin on it when you look at all the contributions, even if um, she was an MP then, Camille Robinson Regis. She spoke very vociferously. Mr. Boynes, Roger Boynes, he was in Parliament. He spoke. Ramesh Maraj, he spoke. So you have all the contributions are there. So I invite people, look at the facts. Let's not be emotional about it. Let's be dispassionate, objective, and clinical. Assess where we are at and then figure out how we're going forward. Because if we continue to delude ourselves and think that you have powers which you don't have, as our president has said, you know, then you will forever be in this dilemma mm -hmm. and you'd be like the Israelites wandering around in the desert for 40 years and going nowhere. In our final five, five minutes, how do you assess the political scenario now? We've had the, the PNM significantly victorious majority whitewashing of the TUP in 2013, the Assembly elections. Uh, we now have uh, the Tobago Falls of Ms. Moore, who are in talks with the TUP. We have independent Watson Dew. Uh, haven't heard much about the NAR in recent times. The, the, the possibilities on September 7th, there are many looking at Ashra Jack and saying, well, he was in charge in 2013. And now Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Allen talking to the city on the membership want, to, want him to remain. As, as their leader. Is, is, the, is there going to be a different scenario, given what you've outlined earlier on about if we are to take your theory about fear and victimization? At one time, Mr. Jack had four seats in the Assembly. He lost that in 2013. Yes. Uh, and he's part of the coalition government. What, how do you sum up the, what may happen on September 7th? Well, as I see it, in the present scenario, Mr. Ashwood Jack has a credibility issue with Tobagonians generally because I think after that 2013 loss, I'm not sure that he handled it in the best possible way to restore that confidence. In other words, you have persons who have questioned, well, why have you gone silent and then now you are seeking to, you know, um, be like Lazarus and rise from the dead. You know, so, I mean, of course, it, that has happened in history before, but we're not sure it's going to repeat itself for this election. So there's a big credibility gap which I don't think he has cured. And then you look at the team he has assembled around him. You know, um, I think Miss Vanilla Allen Toppin would still also have questions to answer to two begonians, you know. So therefore, you ask yourself, is there any real and serious, you know, basis for 
validity of the TOP as a force in this election? As much uh, is there a big difference between the THA elections and the national, uh, national elections on September 7th? Yes, we know what the, the difference is. One is Tobago and one is national. Right. But politically in Tobago, in terms of what may have happened in the last two years since 2015? I would say yes, and I'll tell you why. 